Do you ever experience writer's block or just creativity block where you just can't make a beat? I've only, honestly, I've only experienced it like once or twice. And, and in all these years, in, in my whole, my whole, my whole career, and I've learned how to, I've learned how to come out of it. Okay, I've, I've learned how to come out of it. Why don't you speak to that? Because maybe there's a, a young producer who's watching this, or a, a, a veteran producer who's watching it, who just, you know, they're stuck. It's the ultimate, the ultimate, ultimate power move. If you stuck, and you stuck in your creativity, and you feel like it's just not flowing. And you you have like a writer's block and the, and the creativity is not flowing. You have to tap into your creator. So the ultimate power move is the power of prayer. That's the ultimate power move. I love What's the ultimate the power move. The ultimate power move. And this is power move makers right here. And you are you are the supreme power move maker. But the ultimate power move is the power of prayer. Yeah, it's the only it's the only thing that I believe that it, it, that can change something just like that. That changes it can change the situation, change a scenario just like that. You can't do that on your own, but I believe I believe prayer can do that. So whenever I got into that funk where it's just like, dang, I, can't, I ain't got it today. Like something, I, then I got to get on my knees because I'm not tapped in right with my creator. Because I don't believe I should have writer's block. If I'm tapped in, I should never have that. So that just means that. Either um, I need to I need to humble myself for a minute and take RJ out the equation for a second and put God first in it. And usually when I do that, all, every time that I've done that, I'm back on like boop, right away, like like yeah. That's the ultimate power move, man. Okay, yeah. I love this, and that will be a segment. Truck, I I got a lot of segments I'll be pulling out of this interview. Moving it along because I know we're short on time. Who's your favorite artist? Looking back over your entire career, your entire catalog, who is your favorite artist to work with? That's a terrible question to ask me because there's so many great artists, you know, but if I had to choose one, if I had to choose one, it would be Michael Jackson. Why? The GOAT, the, the, the greatest of all time. Um, the, the artist that pushed me to the limit that I didn't know existed. I didn't know... I didn't know I could be pushed. The artist that um, that would would tell me to leave the egos outside the door and 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 and, and create and push me in a way. I always say Michael Jackson helped me in a way that no other artist helped me. I was so used to working with artists and giving them a sound and keeping it moving and going to the next artist, getting it moving. This was the first artist that had a conversation with me uh, and and pushed me. It was the first because I, I need to paint this picture. Oh. <laughs> um, I was when I started with working Mike, I was 21. I, I so was you're 21, I, 22. You have you have I, I was 21, just about to turn 22. Okay. You you any of us, you get that call working with Michael Jackson, that's that's just different. You done reach my, the top of Mount Olympus. What is at that? 21, at 21, by the way, like I'm not like technically I probably would have just been graduating college, maybe. Maybe. Okay. Right? So Did that's he like push you. Did he push you like the minute that you walked in that door? Oh yeah. Like my first, my first now I got I gotta set it up because you gotta understand how God works in all of this, right? So the, the, the stuff be sounding like a fairy tale, but it's a hundred percent real and it's a hundred percent truth, and it's a reason why I'm here and how I and the reason why I know it's my purpose. I'm on my mom and dad's couch. And at that time I don't live with them anymore. I'm on my own, of course, but I'm at I'm over that house and I fall asleep on that couch in New, in South Jersey, and I had this dream. And in the dream, I saw this glass studio. And I looked through the glass and I could see it was Michael Jackson. I saw, I saw that red shirt that he always wore mm -hmm. through the glass. And I had this dream and it was him in the glass with this red shirt on. And that's all I saw. And I woke up. Not even a few hours later, the phone rings. 
And there's a legendary songwriter on the other line by the name of Carol Bear Sager. She wrote, reach out and touch someone's hand. She wrote the prayer. She wrote so many like big, big songs back in the day. She used to, her husband back in the day was Burke Backrack. So yep. the catalog is crazy. And she calls me and she says, hi Rodney. Um, I don't even know who she is really. She's like, I'm a big fan of yours. I love Say My Name. So she said Say My Name was popping at the time. I love Say My Name. It's my favorite song. And, it's, and it was a Monday afternoon. And she goes, I would love it if you would come to L.A. Would you like to come to Los Angeles to write for Michael Jackson? I'm like, what? This is a couple of hours after you just had this dream. I just had this dream. I just had a dream. I think I told it to. I'm like, I just had a dream. I saw Michael Jackson in the studio in the glass in my dream. She says, so you'll come? I said, yeah. I said, I said when, is this, when do you want me there? She goes, well, I got to call him to try to set it up, but I would love for you to come. I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll be ready. I'll be ready. And in that moment, I hung up the phone with her. I booked myself a ticket to L.A., I got on a plane that night. I checked myself in a hotel room and I just stayed in the hotel room for the next few days waiting for her to call me again. She called me. She called me. I let her know, of course, that I was in L.A. now. She called me on Thursday morning and she said, can you come to my home today for a writing session with myself and Michael? I go to her home in Bel Air and as I'm pulling up the driveway, she has a guest house studio to the left and I see a red shirt through the glass. And I'm like, and man, in that moment, man, I kind of teared up. I ain't gonna front, man. I ain't gonna be all hard because we on, on your show, bro. <laughs> I kind of teared up and was like, God, you just too, you too, you too real to me, man. You too, like, your presence is crazy to me that you would literally show me this four days ago. And now I'm here in it. And, and when I walked in the studio with Michael, I was super nervous at first. Like my whole swag was different. It's crazy. <laughs> and I worked and I worked with Whitney. I worked with I worked with everybody. But but Michael's presence was completely different. And and we talked a we talked a while and then I started playing the piano. And I wasn't really set up to do tracks the way I do. It was more so like me on the piano. Her, she had a guest at her piano and we was writing. And then I looked at Michael and I said, um, I said, man, I would love to continue to work on, on ideas for you. And he goes, I would love that. What do you need? He said, what do you need? I said, man, I just need a studio out here and I need to have my crew out here with me. And he goes, done. And all I know is like the next day, my whole team was flown out and he gave us this studio and I locked in with him for like two years straight. Like I never, looked, I never looked down. Nah, no, I locked him with two two years straight. Um, man, like it was the most amazing. So you really had the opportunity to know and work with Michael. Mike was the homie. I took wow. Mike. I, I rode Michael around Manhattan in my Bentley with the top down. Picked him, picked him up from his crib in Manhattan. Told, called him on the phone and said, "I'm outside." He said, "What are you doing?" And I said, "Come on, we're gonna take a ride." He said, where are we going? I said, we're just going to take a ride. I want you to hear Hot 97. I just want to take you around, around the city. He goes, okay, let me go get my security guard. I said, no, no security guards. It's you and I. He hopped into Bentley. And at first, he looks timid like he never did this. <laughs> and then he get in the Bentley. I turn on Hot 97. I never get what, what came on. It was the Ja Rule and Janet Blackstreet record or whatever. It comes on the radio, and he turns it up. And we ride down, and he's going crazy in the, in the passenger seat like this as we ride through Manhattan. Is that, that one the, of your fondest memories of him? Nah, the, my, my, my fondest memory was him calling my house up. I'm in South Jersey. He's in his apartment in New York. And he calls my house up like 9 o'clock at night and says, um, I was wondering if your mother would make me some peach cobbler. Get out of here. Yeah, because we used to talk about his mom cooking and my mom cooking. And I was like, Mike Love, I was like, my mom makes a cold piece cobbler. He was like, that's my favorite dessert. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.